topics that are a little more complicated than, than maybe you thought they were, and that's okay. We're having to tackle something for the first time. It's all right to, to not realize that an example is more complicated than you thought it was. Um, a lot of people also uh, see, it still seem to be confused about, you know, say supply supply decreases, we end up with excess demand, so prices rise, and as prices rise, for the most part, you guys realize as prices go up, consumers want to buy less. Here's the part a lot of you are still really uncomfortable with. We know supply went down, but when prices start to come back up, Companies respond to that, you know, so maybe they were planning a really big decrease, a 20% decrease in production for some reason, at the given price, but when the prices started to go up, they said, you know what, 20% cut back is a little extreme. Let's only do a 19 or 18% cut back, okay? So when price rises, it's okay <coughs> for quantity of supply to go up, even though initially supply went down. Again, just, you know, industry reacts to something that happens in the market. They make plans to make this big cutback, but then when they see that, when they remember that prices are, are going to start rising, when they do that, they kind of backtrack a little bit. So they take this huge leap, and then when the prices start going forward, like, oh wait a minute, we'll take a few steps back. In the end, overall, overall, you know. There's going to be less bonds sold on the market than before, but it's not as huge of a drop as we initially think it's going to be. Why? Because prices have a chance to react, and companies have a chance to react to the rising price. So I, it was clear from a lot of people's papers that you find this and this kind of somewhat contradictory, and it's not. Okay, it's just multiple rounds of reactions. So keep that in mind. Same thing with like a demand decrease. Demand, you know, um, mad cow disease hits the beef market. People are scared away, so demand decreases. They want to buy less at the given price. Uh, we end up with excess supply, so price falls. When price falls, you guys know what, what the grocery stores um, and the beef producers are going to do. And you're comfortable saying, well, as price goes down, are willing to supply less, they start cutting back on production because they know the market has taken a hit and prices are falling. But it's the other thing that's going on is as beef gets cheaper, some people are willing to come back to the market. Maybe 50% of the U.S. consumers when mad cow first hit, it was actually a huge number. 50% might even be too small. When mad cow disease first hit, you know, let's say 50% of the consumers just abandoned the beef market. And so they started seeing beef prices becoming really cheap. You know, they could pick up a filet mignon for three bucks a pound instead of 10 bucks a pound. And falling prices made a few of them say, hey, you know what? I wasn't gonna buy any beef, but on second thought, maybe I'll buy a little. So overall, we know that this effect is much bigger than this one. So overall, there's going to be less beef sold in the market, but the size of this arrow is going to be the size of this arrow, offset a little bit by this one, right? So it's going to be a big initial decline until prices start to fall and a few consumers are attracted back to the market. Overall, we're going to see that much of a decline in the market. So don't be afraid of, of these things seeming, seeming like they contradict each other. They don't. And if you want to work through a few more examples before the exam, feel free to, to stop on now. So I'd be happy to help you think through them in a little more detail. Um, so as I'm still getting running out of time at the end, I guess I'll be nice today and hand these back at the start. I normally don't do this because 
then you're all distracted for the first 10 minutes of my real lecture. We'll get lost on this, try and catch up on this. Um, but actually, we might have a little extra time at the end of class, no promises, but potentially. And if that's the case, for those of you who didn't make all, get all your points, I want you to have a chance to, to stay after class and, and ask questions. So, um, Mitch, I don't see Michael today here. I made copies of your partners, people, so we each have a copy. Some folks are taking advantage of the fact that they know today's lecture is being videotaped. I know Jeremy's not a video. I know he's not either. Cyril's not. I know your names. I'm paying attention. Or I'm here. I'm just not sitting up front, huh? Right in the back today. There's an uh, exercise that I gave you last time. Uh, I'll post a key to that over the weekend. You can go ahead and check 
your work, and then you'll have next week to come and talk to me if you have any questions. Any questions before I get started about the exam? Carson? I guess I have a question, like, you know, like the corn part of the exercise we had? Yeah. It seems like you could talk your way into, like, four different possibilities <laughs> of the test. Is it going to be, like, a little more... I will do my best on the test to, um, to use examples that are pretty standalone. Yeah. So at the very least, I'll try not to make, like, a series of things that rely on each other, because that just gets really hard for me to grade. I screw up on part one, and it makes it really tricky to grade part two and three. So I'll try to make them standalone stories. Um, my tip which curve to shift is the hardest part. And there are wrong answers. <laughs> there are answers that don't make sense. Um, if you spell out your assumptions really clearly and explain to me how you understand the story uh, and what assumptions you're making leading up to that story, that'll help a lot. It'll help me understand. Maybe you've interpreted the story differently than I have. So just be sure to explain to me what story is going through your brain. Um, and then I'll just make sure that your story, you know, makes pretty good sense and that based on the story you're trying to tell that your curves and shifts and things. Yeah. Any other questions? How about the um, equations for the uh, compounding and discount? Hmm. I suppose I could give that to you. It's just the one. I'll give you the one basic one. Probably Vn equals V0 times 1 plus I of Vn. And from there you can manipulate it. You know, if we're calculating for present value instead of future value, I'll let you manipulate the equation to come up with that. Only because I went back on my word. And I guess I was just a tiny bit confused on, are they pretty much the same with um, discounting and compound? No. It's, um, it's the same starting equation. So if you, whichever one I give you, all you have to do is rearrange it to get the other one. Okay. Um, and you just have to decide what it is that you're trying to solve for. Uh, if I give you Vn, so the future value equals the present value times 1 plus the interest rate raised to the n. I give that to you, but it asks you to solve for the, you know, I give you a present and have, or give you the future and ask you to solve for the present. You just have to move it, move this guy over and that okay. guy over algebraically. Uh, and just remember, you guys, when you calculate these things on your calculator, order, order matters. You know, you've got to do this first, and then that, and then that. You kind of have to work your way from inside the parentheses outward in order to get the right answer. You can't multiply this by this first and then raise the whole thing at the end. Those are not equipped lines. So. And if you want to go through any of the math in more detail with me, don't feel bad if you're not comfortable with math. Um, this class spans all kinds of different mathematical backgrounds and skills. Um, if you're uncomfortable with this and you don't understand it, or you don't understand how to manipulate it to get you know, V0 instead of Vn, don't be shy. Just come and see me and we'll work. No such thing as a stupid question. You say we will have to solve for I test? It is a bonus. Just to give you an incentive to try something that might be beyond your comfort zone. Anything else? Alright, let's keep going. Let's get to some more complicated stuff that I promise will not be on the exam. Today is not on the exam. Uh, that means it will come back to haunt you eventually, but not on this first one. So we left off. We pretty much exhausted this equation. We did everything we could do with it. We solved for this, given all the other pieces of information. We solved for that. We solved for that. We didn't solve for n, but it rarely makes sense to ask how many years you should take a loan out for. Often you don't have a choice bank will tell you. And if you can pay it off sooner, you should. <laughs> so, um, let's do some more advanced stuff today. I think this will be, this will just kind of get you warmed back up at first. Um, 
to restore a riparian area. Again, we're in the world of having a small number of projects to choose from. So in this case, we've got two restoration projects. Um, they both generate the same total benefit, total cost. So if you had not attended class on Tuesday and had no idea what the discount rate was and the time value of money, if you were completely naive, you would look and you'd say, gosh, both projects generate the same benefits and costs. Benefits minus cost is the net benefit. They're equivalent. We should be indifferent between these two projects. Doesn't matter which one. But those benefits and costs occur at different times. Okay, and so now you know you're not naive. Uh, you know the fact that because the benefits and costs flow differently through time, a dollar today is not going to pay the same as a dollar tomorrow. Uh, and so we have to put them in the same time frame before we can correctly compare them. So which restoration project is preferred? Let's go ahead and assume a 10% interest rate or a discount rate. If that's your preference for, for time, taking risk and inflation and interest into consideration. Here's your table. If you happen to print out, to print out you've got this already. If not, take a minute. Let me explain what it is. Each of these projects, we're going to, uh, you incur all the benefits costs within a four-year period. So for here's each year of our, our time frame. Um, this is project one. So in year one, project one generates no benefits. It takes a little while for the, gener for the benefits to start to accrue. In year two, we finally start getting some benefits. Okay? And I've got five dollars here. Obviously, that's a pretty small number of you to think of as five thousand if you want to make it more realistic. Um, in year three, even more benefits. Not just the seven is not five plus another two. It's five in year two, an additional seven in year three, an additional eight in year four, and then the project stops generating benefits. So over its four year lifetime, if you add these guys up, it generates $20, or if you, again, if you want to think about realistically, $20,000 worth of benefits. On the cost side, so far we're gonna make it. Um, on the cost side, this project doesn't generate any benefits up front, but it sure requires some costs, right? Okay, so you've got to invest five dollars right from the get-go uh, in order to get this project started. And then in years two, three, and four, we've just got some maintenance costs. You know, every year you got to go back in and, and maintain a piece of that project and keep it running. So overall, $20 worth of benefit, $8 worth of cost. If this were your only project to consider, it looks like benefits are going to outweigh those costs. We need to discount them first, but it looks like if this were the only thing you had to choose from, it might not be a bad choice. But let's go ahead and account for the fact that this dollar in year three is not the same as this dollar in year two. Okay, and this $5 of cost right up front is not the same as $5 worth of benefit in year two. So we need to get all these things into one year of information. Here's the easiest way to do that. First, go ahead and calculate net benefit. So fill in this, this column here. Okay, net benefit again is just asking what's the total benefit? Subtract from that how much it costs to generate it. And everything that's left over is just slush money. Are you to go to the Bahamas or you to take and go and do a different project with? So calculate your net benefit. In year one, the net benefit is zero minus five. So in year one, you lose five dollars overall. In year two, five dollars worth of benefits minus one dollar cost leaves you with four dollars of net benefit. So four dollars worth of benefit after paying all the costs that year. Pretty good, pretty happy. Six, seven, and so on and so forth. I won't put the numbers up there quite yet. After you've done that, now you can discount. Now you can say, you know, $4 in year two is equivalent to how many dollars today? Okay, so discount it through time. 
So we're just going to use our simple discounting formula. What are these guys? Once I fill them, fill them in. Looking at our formula, what piece of the formula do these guys represent? Future values or present values? When do these net benefits take place? This guy um, depends on how we treat year one. Treat year one as if it's a year from today. So even this is in the future. So these are our future values. I've given you VN for each year. You've got to treat each year separately, though. Right? Because each of those rows has a different N. In order for... Today is year, year zero. Okay. So we need to put that $5 a year from now into today's terms. How do we do that? We use, I've given you VN, I've given you I. N is how many years do I have to wait to experience this amount of money? In this case, you have to wait one year. So I've given you all of these pieces of information we want to solve for this one get it by itself, we just divide both sides by 1 plus i over n. There's the formula we need. So, plug and chug. Times 5 is the future value divided by 1 plus 10 percent. We've got to wait one year to experience it. That gives us a present value of $4.55. What does that mean? On the test, I might ask you to explain, what does this number really mean? Are we actually going to lose $4.55 today because of this project? We're not actually going to do that. When do we actually have to spend the money? A year from now. Right? Year one. Because today's year zero in this case. So we don't actually have to spend minus. You know, we don't actually have to lose 455 today, but losing five dollars a year from now would be equivalent to losing 455 today. What's another way to look at this? Anybody think of another way to interpret this so that it makes more common sense? What if I stuck four dollars and fifty-five cents in the bank today? How much would I have in the bank a year from now at 10% interest compounding annually? What's the future value, right? If this is the <coughs> present value, what's the future value of this amount? Five dollars. So one way to think about these present value numbers that always kind of makes better sense to me, kind of intuitively. Is if, you know, we know a year from now we need five bucks to cover the cost of this project. Today, if we stick this amount of money in the bank, $4.55, and let it sit there for a year, earning 10% interest, we'll have the five bucks we need in year one. Okay, so that's one way to interpret a present value. How much money would I need right now so that n years from now, I'll have what I need. I'll have the equivalent of what I need. Okay. So don't just calculate these numbers and move on. Stop and ask yourself, 
how would I explain the meaning of this thing to my programmer? I'll ask that on an exam. My exams are not about regurgitation. They're about making sure you actually understand this material. And if you just wanted to memorize stuff and spit out numbers, you'd probably get about a 70% of my exam. Okay, that's a C or a D student in this class. So make your brain work every time you do this. All right, so how do we calculate the, so two years from now, this project is actually gonna start generating more benefits than costs. And we'll have $4 worth of extra leftover benefits in year two, after we've covered our costs for that year. Calculate the, the present value of $4 two years from now. Two years from now, I know it's worth four dollars, but what's it worth in today's terms? How do you calculate it? Tell me which numbers to put into our formula. Let's be in. Why would I be just as happy with that? Uh, interest rates, right? Interest, you could earn interest. Because if I had 331 today, I'd stick it in the bank for two years, and at the end of those two years, I'd have exactly $4. So of course I'd be equally happy with those two options, because they're equivalent. All right, what do we get for the rest? What number, uh, what's that formula? divided by 110 raised to the what? Number three. Because we've got to wait three years to get those six dollars. And so on and so forth. Be really careful. Um, you know it makes sense right now. Never fails in about half the class. A question like this, this is a reasonable question for an exam. Especially since we've gone through an example like this in, together in class. Never fails. Somebody's not paying attention, they're trying to regurgitate, and they put n equals 1, n equals 1, n equals 1, n equals 1. No, you don't have to wait one year to get those $7, you've got to wait four years. Okay? So be careful, make a note to yourself that that n is really important, you have to be careful with it. Alright, so once we calculate each of these present values, we can finally add them up and say, what is the present value, the net benefits of this project? We've got benefits and costs for this project that come at different times. Tell me, after paying all of our bills, how much benefit do we have left? And what is it worth in today's terms? And what do we get? Go in your table. What's the net benefit 
the present value, there's a couple of ways we can say this. Present value of net benefits or the discounted net benefit, present value and discounted, right? Those two word, words go together. Um, and it's probably bad practice on my part to switch in between them, but economists do it all the time, so they might as well get comfortable with it. But these two terms, these two phrases are the same thing. Do you have to add the, like where it goes one, two, three, four, you're changing the reader, do you have to add those to when you do the 20 at the bottom? No, it actually, um, there's no year that goes here. And we really can't do anything directly with these numbers, Joe. You can see right here that $20 worth of benefit minus $8 of benefit equals $12 of benefit left over after paying all of our costs. But those numbers are, are meaningless because they don't take into consideration time. Okay, those are the numbers you'd use if you didn't know anything about the time value of money. That would be a mistake. So we, we're not going to use any information down here, and therefore we're not going to use, you know, a five or sum of the number of years or or even just the total number of years or four. We have to handle each year separately and that will result in the correct number down here. So this number is going to be the sum of each of these guys. Okay, so what is it? Eight. Zero five. Zero five. Everybody else get that? All right, so great. Now we've got the present value of one of the projects. Let's go check out the other project. There it is. There's the number. Uh, you can check the numbers. Make sure you got all the right ones from that previous table.
Can we compare them now? They're both in present value terms. So apples to apples. Um, you guys remember the number? It was 805 for the project one versus 951 for project two. Which project do you prefer? Project two. Right, the one with a higher net benefit. I want to point out something about this project too. The fact that it has this nice uniform flow, that every year the costs are the same, and in this case it's even more extreme every year, the, the, sorry, the benefits and the costs are the same, so every year we get the same net benefit. If you find yourself in that situation, you can do this table if you want, or there's a shortcut. And I'm really not a big fan of shortcuts. It's, uh, it's good to know that they exist. So because Project 2 generates this uniform flow, same amount of money, net benefits every year, we can do a shortcut. A more confusing version of our previous formula. And no, I can't derive that from this off the top of my head. Uh, so this one would just be I would never ask you to memorize this sucker. I could ask you to use it, not on this, this coming exam, but in the future. If I gave you this formula, you would be able to figure out whether it was appropriate to use it and what pieces of information went where in the formula. Um, R. Instead of the N, I've got an R here. Why an R? What can we think of to help us remember why, what that means? R is for repeated. Right? We've repeated three dollars in that benefit year after year after year. Okay, so when you see that R, think repeated. What's the repeated value in this story? We've got a repeated value of three dollars in that benefit year after year after year. When we get those benefits, we stick them in a bank and we earn interest on them. Okay. N is the length of the entire project. So Joe, here is where that last four, you know, the fact that it's a total of four years, this is the only circumstance where that total number of years matters. And it only, it only you know, the only reason it matters in this case is because every year we get the same number repeated over and over and over again for four, a total of four years. Okay, so R times, now the order of operations is even more complicated. Just again, start inside the smallest parentheses. Start here, then do this guy. Then do this minus this guy. Then do that times that, and finally divide it by that. So if you plug in the, the numbers from our project two, three dollars repeated, over four years at a 10% interest rate, we should get the same exact answer as we did from our table. I like the table because it helps me remember what the heck we're really doing and why it makes sense. But this is the formula that bankers use. Okay. Um, we'll see in a minute, we're gonna rearrange this formula to figure out car payments. Repeated car payments in order to pay off a $30,000 vehicle over the next seven years, right, at a certain interest rate. Voila, it's not magic, it's just a silly formula. All right, so this, we've already done this, project one net benefit, discounted net benefit, we prefer project two. Why do we prefer project two in hindsight? What was special about that project compared to project one? Why would we? For it just intuitively. Even if you don't have a calculator sitting in front of you, if all you have are those two tables and no calculator to do any calculation, let's see if we could guess, not guess, intuitively figure out which project we might prefer. Sometimes it's obvious. Okay. So pull those two tables out or look at them in your notes. What was good about project two compared to project one? There were no negative benefits. Yeah, and you know what? Actually, Joe, that's a really great point that every 
here, we know exactly what's going to happen. It's a nice uniform flow. Our calculations actually don't account for that. That's a, it's a completely valid benefit that these typical calculations don't account for. So that is something to keep in mind, that if for some reason you prefer a nice smooth budget, then you should give a little extra weight to that project. What was the bummer about project one? What wasn't good about it? It has something to do with the minus five rate. Not only do we not make money, we're investing a bunch of money up front, right? Five, I don't know, five dollars, five thousand dollars, right up front, and then only a thousand each year after that. And how much benefit do we get right up front? Not at all. Does that sound like what people appreciate? Do people appreciate having to pay their bills now and enjoy the benefits sometime in the future? Completely the opposite of most people. All right. We want to enjoy the benefits now. We'll worry, you know, costs would be great if we could incur those someplace off in the future. So project one, we didn't like for that reason. So, at least for project two, we get our benefits a little bit sooner. And instead of having the costs right up front, we spread those costs through the years. All right, so we've got a smaller upfront cost in project two. In project one, again, the net benefit, the discounted net benefit is lower because benefits are pushed off into the future and its costs are pulled up front. And we don't like that. So even if you don't have your calculator, you can't remember these stupid formulas, intuitively, you should be able to say something intelligent about which project you might prefer for which reasons. And sometimes it's not. You know, sometimes one project has benefits sooner, but costs are also sooner. Or costs are in the future, but benefits are also in the future. And in those cases, you're not going to be able to come to a hard and fast conclusion. You'll, you will have to go crunch the numbers. Okay, but try to use your intuition first. And again, I could ask a question like that on an exam, um, you know, where I give you some tables uh, without a calculator and just ask you to talk about what's given the time value of money, what's good about this project, and what's not so good, and which one do you think you would prefer? Okay. All right, so here we go. Here's some more, just a, let's use this more sophisticated formula that we've got. And all these formulas have really fancy names. Just so the bankers can make you feel like you're stupid and the car dealership guy. He knows what amortization means. And he uses it because it makes you feel insecure and you're not going to bargain quite as hard for your car. So here's probably borrow 40000 It wasn't very good. It was 40000 for your brand new pickup. They offer you an annual interest rate of 12%, which is pretty darn high right now. It wasn't high that long ago. About five years ago, that would have been about right. They're going to compound the interest annually. That's a pretty good deal. And they're going to give you 10 years to pay this thing back. So this is a pretty generous, pretty generous bank to put for that high interest rate. How can we figure out our annual payment? We know car payments are the same every time the same. Repeated. So it's got to be one of the formulas with an R in it. And every time we're going to pay the same amount, so we can use this R. What else do we know in this, this story? We know there's got to be a, we're trying to solve for R. What information are we given? What's the $40,000? That's the sticker price. That's the present value of the vehicle. And we've got our interest rate and we've got N. We've got everything we need. We just have to rearrange that formula we were looking at before. Right? Before the VO was over here and the R was over here, we have to rearrange the formula a little bit to solve for the variable that we want. Again, I wouldn't make you 
memorize this formula, I'll probably give you one version of it. I might give you the V0 equal to R divided by. And you could just rearrange it to, to solve for whatever piece of information I'm asking. So plug and chug. Forty thousand. What's I? The interest rate. What number needs to go there? Just point two, not one point one two. It's not one plus I. It's just I all by itself. So forty thousand times zero point one two. That's twelve percent converted to decimals. Get your order correct here. One point. One, one, two raised to the minus ten. <clears throat> Anybody know what a minus exponent means? And we all know what two squared means. The four squared. <clears throat> A little sidebar for the mathematically afraid, fearful of math. Get over it. We all know what four squared is. This is just four times four. What the heck is four to the minus two? Doesn't make any sense, does it? There's no nice like, explanation for it. Here's what. Here's all it means. That minus sign, all it's telling you is to drop that whole term down in the denominator. Okay, so when you see that minus, just think, oh, I need to put it down in the bottom in the denominator instead of the numerator. So this thing is actually just equal to 1 over 4 squared. Okay, the negative is just signaling to you to take that thing, stick it in the denominator and then you can get rid of that obnoxious minus sign. Okay, and so then it would be 1 over 4 times 4. So that minus n in there, let me just... I don't think I actually knew that until graduate school. And I was like, why didn't somebody just tell me that? Why is this whole, my whole high school career, I wondered what the heck minus n really meant. Um, so let's see. We can make our formula look, look slightly prettier. C0 times I divided by 1 minus 1 plus I to the minus N. Open tank. How do we rewrite that? Whatever the exponent applies to, it's got a, a negative exponent, exponent, just throw that thing down into the bottom of a, of a fraction. Okay, so 1 minus, throw that sucker down in the denominator and drop the negative. Okay, so it didn't make it that much prettier, but a little bit. <coughs> what do you get? What's our annual payment. We're only paying the bank once a year. I know that's unusual and in a minute we'll get to monthly payments. Okay, so for a $40,000 truck every year we'll pay a little over seven grand. We're paying seven grand every year for 10 years. How much money at the end of 10 years, how much money will you have doled out for this truck? Just how many dollar bills? This many each year? 10 years. Okay, so the future, in the future, by the time you get done with this thing, you will have handed over $70,000 worth of money. That sounds like a lot. But keep in mind that we didn't dole out $70,000 right from the get-go. We've got to wait 10 years to pay off some of that $40,000. And we like pushing costs into the future. So maybe it's worth paying more in the end for the convenience of paying it off slowly. Maybe not. Maybe you're the type of person who's like, no, that sucks. 
I want to pay this thing off right now. Keep in mind, though, you had $40,000 and had the option of giving it to the car dealership or giving it to them slowly. What could you do with that $40,000 if you held on to it and doled it out a little more slowly? What are you giving up by giving them? Give the forty thousand dollars to him. What can't you do with that money now? Come on, it's always the answer to any of the questions in this section. Now, falls, fails, remount, interest, interest earned. All right, so it's it's kind of a funny game. This seems crappy to pay seventy thousand dollars for a forty thousand dollar truck, but. We're here in year zero. We've got $40,000 in our account. Instead of handing it over to that guy, we leave it in the bank for a year and earn interest. And at the end of the year, we pay them their first installment of $7,000. So now we have $40,000 plus the interest we earned minus seven. We still probably have $32,000 sitting in the bank. That $32,000 sits there for an entire another year earning interest. And at the end of the second year, you pay them their $7,000. But each year, you've earned interest, money that you didn't have at the beginning of this problem. You had $40,000. And you weren't going to earn any interest on it if you just gave it to the bank, right? So keep in mind that even though this seems really like a ripoff, there are both benefits and costs to having a loan. And one of the benefits is, what if you had a savings account that earned 15%? Then it would really make sense to pay it off slower. <laughs> Unless you're a really savvy investor who knows of a really lucrative business opportunity that's going to generate huge returns, right? And there are people out there that are willing to take risks like that to find those opportunities. Okay? But just keep in mind, my point is, you always feel like you're getting ripped off the loan. Just bought it, this new piece of property. It closed down it yesterday. So it's again. I know the purchase price of this place that we just bought. And then I looked at the banker's estimate of how much we paid for it in the end, and it about fell down. It's really distressing. But I couldn't pay the full purchase price right now, even if they left, even if I had that option. I, I couldn't afford to do it. And so one of the costs being able to purchase this property when I don't have the cash up front is to pay a little interest on it. Right? So there's also convenience in taking loans. You just have to be fully aware of what you're getting yourself into and decide whether you personally feel like it's worth it. All right, off my soapbox. Moving forward. Amortization. Um, yeah. What if you didn't make any payments along the way? Got the $40,000 loan. 12% interest again. The bank was super nice and said, you know what? Don't even bother. You don't have to pay me anything until you're done. I'll give you the chunk of cash to go buy your truck. Ten years from now, I'll see you, and you can owe me how much. Which formula should we use? Are we doing a repeated payment in this story? What are we trying? What information have I given you? Present value, forty thousand dollars. What am I asking you for? Future value, ten years from now, with no payments in between. Which formula is that? It's the simple one. The old. What is it? We want future value, we have present value, we're going to let it sit, we're going to borrow this money for 10 years at 12% annual interest rate, annually compounded, right, again, always make sure that your interest rate is in the same terms as your N, annual and annual in this case, 
So, 40,000. How much is this truck, how much are we going to dole out in the end for it? $124,000. You thought your bank was being nice. Why do you owe more? When you pay off that first $7,000 in year one under the other option, what have you just prevented them from doing? Charging you interest on interest on interest for that $7,000 for the next 10 years. In year two, when you pay another $7,000, what are you doing? You're taking away another $7 that they can't, or $7,000 that they can't charge you interest on interest for the next eight years. Conversely, you let that $40,000 sit there for 10 years, they're taking full advantage of compounding interest on interest on interest every year for 10 years. So of course you're going to owe more in the end. What's the take home message? You take out a car loan, what's one way you can reduce the cost of that car? Make payments more often. What if you have a monthly payment on a car? Is there anything preventing you from paying that in two chunks in a month? Depending on your cash flow? Would it be that big of a difference to you to send to $150 car payments in a month rather than just one $300 at the end of the month? <coughs> similar to you, it can make a big difference in the amount that you end up, because then you're preventing them from being able to charge you interest on interest for two weeks at a time, right? Additional two weeks that you're stealing away from them. All right. Oh, what else have we got? You guys have already learned this lesson, but let's just check our, <coughs> check our, uh, make sure we remember how to do this correctly. They tell you an annual interest rate of 12%, but then you read the fine print, and it says they're going to compound your interest every month. And so each month, they're going to recalculate how much you owe them and start charging you interest on that amount. And the next month, they'll recalculate it again and charge you interest on the interest from last month. I only know how to use this formula when the frequency of the payments equals the frequency of the compounding. So if I do monthly compounding, I only know how to make this formula work if we do monthly payments also. There's probably a way to do annual compounding with monthly payments, but I don't know how car dealer would have me on that one. So here's our formula. What number should we plug in? What's B0? Casey, what's B0? What's the number? 4,000. I is still, oh, what's I? It's, all right, if we're going to be doing monthly payments, and well, let's put it this way, we're going to be compounding monthly, we need a monthly interest rate. How do we get the monthly interest rate from the annual? Annual interest rate divided by 12 months, and that's 1%. So what is I? 0 0.01, 1%, 0.01. 1 minus 1.01. Then we said 10 years, 120 months. Okay, we're going to make 120 payments on this vehicle. So we're doing it monthly for 10 years. What's our monthly payment? If they're compounding monthly? If they're compounding, okay, so let's do this one piece at a time. And again, I wish I knew mathematically how to do this, but let's intuitively think this through. The compounding interest monthly instead of annually, how's that going to affect how much we end up paying for this car in total? Now that we're compounding interest monthly instead of annually, we pay in more in the end for this car or less? More, right? They're charging us interest on interest more often, so we're going to end up paying more. But what's counteracting that effect? By making payments monthly instead of annually, what are we doing to them? We're 
stealing some of their money back. Right? By making payments more often, we're lowering the amount that we end up paying for this car in the end. Hard to say, just off the top of your head without a calculator, how these two opposite forces are going to turn out. You know, whether in the end we're going to end up paying more for the car overall or less for the car than the first calculation that we did. So let's just, but again, stop and think about you're sitting in the car dealership and they're throwing these numbers out to you and you don't have your calculator or your silly little formulas with you. You can still say something intelligent and figure out something intelligent about the effects of these different terms, right? Your monthly payment is 574 a month. Um, how much are we paying per year just so we can compare to the previous option? How do we figure that out? 574 a month for 12 months. This is how much per year. So over the course of the year, you'll dole out $6,888 bills, actually less than the $7,079 that we were doing before. So apparently this effect counteracts this one, okay, by more. Uh, how much do we end up paying for this thing in total? $574. 12 months in a year, 10 years, 68,000, right? We just multiply this guy by 10 years, 68,866. So this is actually a better deal, even though they're compounding more often. The paying monthly is <clears throat> enough to make up for the extra compounding, and more so, it's a better deal. Okay, you can do these calculations on your own. Be quick, intuitively though, we're back to compounding annually and paying annually, <clears throat> which now we know is not the best deal. The deal will be just to be compounded annually to make monthly payments. Right. Yeah, ideally, exactly. Ideally, it would be compound annually. Part of the interest on interest as infrequently as possible, but then pay them as regularly as you can afford to, and that would drive that that sixty-eight thousand even lower. All right, so they come back, they offer you compounding annually, which is a good deal, but annual payments, you know that's not a very good deal. They know you're a poor college student, so they offer to let you pay it over 15 years and so What's gonna happen to your annual payments now that they've stretched it over 15 years? Yeah, it goes down. That's a good thing for poor college students. Uh, what's that going to do for the total amount you end up forking over for this vehicle? All right, before we had annual compounding with annual payments, that was about $7,000 a year, $70,000 for the car in the end. Now they're allowing you to pay that money, that $40,000 off over five additional years, the same interest rate in compounding. Your monthly payments go down stretching it out over a longer time, but what goes up? Why would they possibly offer this to you? Yeah, because they get five extra years of charging you interest on interest on interest from the previous 10 years, right? So let's see. I mean, again, intuitively you can point in which direction things are going to move. How do they turn out in the end? Well, you probably should sit down with your calculator and, and do a little calculation. Only thing we're changing in the story is our N. We're back to 15 because we're compounding annually and paying annually. Um, our annual payments are down, like, just like we said. Right? They're not 7,000, they're 5,800. So again, for a broke college student, that's a good thing. But we're paying that over 15 years. Let's see how, yeah, let's see which way we end up going here. 88,000. What was the original amount when we had annual, annual for 10 years? A little over 70. So it's exactly what we thought. Our annual payments are down. Okay, if I knew how to calculate monthly, monthly payments would also be down. Uh, and the total cost of the vehicle has gone up. 
So just things to be aware of when you're you're out there comparing projects that have different pros and cons, different flows of cat of costs and benefits, and you're out there negotiating your first mortgage, writing process, lots of money involved, make you fall out of your chair. Sit down and be empowered and be informed. It'll freak your mortgage lender out when you can spit the number out before they can. Makes them very nervous. You can negotiate for a lower interest rate. Okay, so just take home messages. We've already lower the total cost of your loan by making payments along the way. And as you lengthen the loan period, yeah, your annual or monthly payments go down, but the total loan cost will go up. Common sense. Okay, a different approach. I think kind of going in the opposite. I can never actually remember what these different terms mean, capitalization versus amortization. Every time I have to look it up and be like, which one is that? Apparently, capitalization is this. How much should you pay for a ranch? Okay, you're interested in buying a property as a business. And you want to know, well, how much should I really offer these people? They're asking five million, but I think that's ridiculous. Let me sit down and figure out as a business person how much I really should be willing to pay for this property. The maximum amount that makes sense to pay for this property. What would you think about when you're coming up with that number? How much should I pay for a ranch? Well, that depends on how much net revenue it's going to generate for me each year. How much money, how much profit, profit and net revenue will be used pretty interchangeably. How much net revenue or profit can I make off this thing each year? 20 years from now, do I expect the value of the land to have changed? The land itself hasn't changed, but you know demand and supply of land changes and therefore prices change over time. You know, do you expect, you know, you buy a ranch outside of Pinedale, Wyoming, you can guess that 20 and 30 years from now, it's going to be worth a lot more. Why? Going back to our demand and supply section. Why would a ranch outside of Pinedale, Wyoming be worth more in the future? What are we assuming is going to happen? Inflation, just the general rise of prices, but that's the same as saying the price of soda is going to be higher. We're assuming in that story that demand for land outside of Pinedale is probably going to go up. You know, that as we get more and more people, more and more wealthy people, they'll be wanting more people that want to buy ranches outside of Pinedale for, for fun. So you have to take that into consideration. Uh, what their interest rate is on your loan or the opportunity cost of your own money. This is a really complicated problem. Too complicated for us to tackle in this particular lecture. We'll get to a little bit of it. But if you want to take all of these things into consideration, go to one of our references, Workman. The author is Workman. It's Range Economics, I think is the name. I have a copy of it. If you're interested in this for personal reasons, come and borrow the book. I'll let you photocopy this part of the chapter. Um, so page 131 of, of Workman. Write that down because I won't remember it. If you think you might want it, write it down for me. Um, so that'll explain how to tackle all of these complicated details at the same time. Let's see, I think we do a simplified example. Considering this ranch, it generates $15,000 of net revenue. Okay, so it could, maybe it generates, it, it brings in, you know, when you sell all your calves, you bring home like $300,000 worth of money, right, from the sale barn, in the big wheelbarrow. But then you go and you pay all your bills, and they're $285,000 worth of bills to pay for all the stuff that went into those cattle, and you're left with $15,000 left over to take a vacation or do something else. Every year that happens. We can figure out, uh, what do we want to know? We know if we buy this ranch, it's going to generate $15,000 worth of revenue every year for how many years? However many years you own that thing, forever, if you held it that long. What does that sound like? Word you should think about when you see fifteen thousand dollars every year. Repeating R. This has got to have something to do.
do it in our formula. What do we want to know? When are we trying to buy this ranch in this story? I don't know if I've said it very clearly. Let's assume we want to buy, buy the ranch today. So what do we want to know? We want to know its present value. We want to know what is it worth paying today for this ranch that's going to generate repeated net benefit of $15,000 every year. Each year that I, own, I earn that money, I can stick it in an account, in an account and earn 4% annual interest with annual compounding. How many years am I going to earn interest on the, the first $15,000 that I plunk in the bank from the revenue, from that revenue? If I left it there, I could earn the interest forever. And in the second year of $15,000, I could earn interest forever minus one year. Right? So that's kind of intuitively what our plan is. Here's the simplification. I'm not going to deal with changes in the land value. Let's just assume that the real value of the land Whatever it's worth today is the same amount that it's going to be worth in the future, fixing for inflation, adjusting for inflation. Okay, so the real value of the land is not going to change. There's our formula. What's the present value of this ranch? We've got R, 15,000. We've got I, 0.04. Here's the tricky part. If you take care of this ranch and do things right, for how many years will it generate $15,000 worth of real net revenue? Ignoring inflation, taking care of inflation. If you do things right, forever. If you manage it properly, that ranch will forever generate the same amount of net revenue, assuming that prices stay the same relative to each other, that cap prices stay the same relative to fuel prices. They might both go up, but relative to each other, they're staying the same. Time. If that's true, what number do you put in for n? A really big one. 100,000 years, 1,000 years. Doesn't matter. Infinity. Absolutely. Plug it in. Can your hand calculator handle infinity? Something raised to the negative infinity of both things, the calculator's going to explode. Okay. So here's what you can do. You can either just plug a slightly smaller number in to get a sense for how much it's worth. Okay, so 100,000, the calculator can't handle that, 1,000, until it can handle it. And just watch what happens to those numbers. Where did the time go? Holy moly. Mathematically, real quick, That thing is negative. So if we had 1 over 1.04 to a really giant number, if this thing was 1.04 to the 100,000, what would, would this piece, just this bottom part, would it be a really big number or a really small number? Yeah, I mean, you just play around in the calculator with it. And as long as this thing's greater than one, when you raise it to a really big exponent, this thing gets huge. So this equals one over a huge number. Something divided by a really giant number is approximately what? When you divide, when we do one divided by two, one divided by four, as that bottom number keeps getting bigger and bigger, to your answer. It's smaller and smaller and smaller. If it's one over a huge number, infinity, what's it pretty darn close to? One divided by a giant number. If you take a piece of pie and divide it into quadrillion slices, how big is each slice? Almost zero. So this whole thing, 1.04 to the minus infinity, goes to and 1 minus 0 is just 1. 15,000 times 1 divided by 0.04.
So when you have something that's a uniform stream that's forever, the formula is really simple. The uniform value, 15,000, divided by the interest rate, 0.04. The present value of this ranch that generates $15,000 worth of net revenue every year for the next infinity years, you should only be willing to pay $375,000 for it. savings account only earns 4% interest compounded annually. Just a cool little math trick, not just more fun, like just to get comfortable with numbers. They're not nearly as scary as they always seem.